Check, mic check, one, two, three. <clears throat> check, mic check, one, two, three. All right, thank you very much. let's pray and begin the sermon. Lord, I pray that the preaching of your word would be a blessing to your people again. And Lord, truly, uh, it is the scriptures and the scriptures alone that edify us, that work in us and clean us up and draw us close to you and do everything for us as believers. And we are thankful to you for the holy scriptures. We thank you, Lord, for the for preserving your word in the King James Bible and for giving it to us. And we pray, Lord, that as we uh, meditate for some time upon the scriptures, that it would be a blessing to your people and pray, Lord, that it would produce the fruit that you want us to bear in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, this morning I would like to speak to you about chastisement. And that's the subject that I'm going to cover in this sermon. God's chastisement. Turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31 and we will read verses 18 to 20. Jeremiah 31, 18 to 20. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastised me and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented, and after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh, I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. And from this passage today, I would like to speak to you about God's chastisement in your life as a born again believer. I want you to remember this. God's chastisement is not for the unsaved people. They will be the recipients of his wrath and his punishment in the eternal lake of fire ultimately. 
But as a born again Christian, what God does with you is that he chastises you as a father chastises his son. And you know all, I'm sure most of you will be acquainted with all the scriptures like Hebrews 12 and other places in Proverbs and Psalms where chastisement is clearly explained and the Lord willing we will look at a few of those verses. But before I talk about chastisement, let me say a few words about God's will. A lot of Christians talk about God's will, almost everybody. They want to know God's will. They want to seek God's will. They want to do God's will. They want to be in the center of God's will. But you know what the problem is? Christians who say and speak so much about God's will are not willing to pay the price to be in the center of God's will. Yes, you heard it right. To be in God's will, there is a price that you have to pay. And it's not easy to pay that price. You know what that price is? That price is chastisement. Unless you allow God to chastise you, you cannot and will not be in God's will. Knowing God's will, Christians take it so lightly. You know, they think, oh, it's a breeze. I just have to pray and uh, read the Bible and I will know God's will. That's not how it is. God's will is not just about God telling you what to do. Most of the times he will not tell you what to do. He will make you do it through chastisement. And I will explain what I'm saying in a moment. With, uh, they talk about God's will and they don't want to pay the price. As I've said, keep that in mind. Paying the price. What does it mean? What is the price? What is the cost that you have to pay to be in God's will? It is absolute surrender to God. Absolute surrender and submission. The word I want you to make note of is this, submission. You surrender yourself and submit to your, uh, yourself to God. And then and only then can you be in God's will as a born again Christian. You have taken the first step to enter God's will by trusting Jesus Christ as your savior. All right. You, you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's wonderful. You are a saved born again Christian. But you see, in order to continue in God's will as a saved person, God requires absolute surrender from you and submission. Submission. And that's what we're going to look at in this passage today. Uh, what most Christians don't understand is that we are as Ephraim here in this passage. How is Ephraim de described? As a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Look at that as a bullock, which is unaccustomed to the yoke. What would a bullock do if it's unaccustomed to the yoke? It would fight, it would not allow the farmer or whoever it is who's trying to put a yoke on it. He would not allow him to do it. As a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. As Ephraim was in our text, we are naturally against spiritual things, you see. Christians don't understand this sometimes. Your flesh is constantly fighting and constantly trying to keep you in subjection to itself so that you don't concentrate on spiritual things so that you will not do anything that is spiritual. You say, uh, I, I, I know I must pray, but I'm unable to pray. You know why you're unable to pray? Because of your flesh. It fights against prayer because prayer is spiritual. Anything that is spiritual doesn't agree with your flesh. Your flesh hates everything that is spiritual. And uh, Christians fail to see that. Uh, that because we are still in the flesh, we are as a bullock that is unaccustomed to the yoke. And we are naturally against, against spiritual things and against what God wants us to do. So again, what God... God wants us to do is God's will. We are naturally against doing God's will because God's will for your life is a spiritual thing. It goes against your flesh. It goes against the world. It goes against your thinking. It goes against your feeling many times. And that's why we are as that bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. <coughs> 
The flesh doesn't allow us to come under the yoke of God. Knowing God's will is not something for you just to find out, as I've said, and then decide whether you will do it or not. You do that once with God and he will not show you his will again. He's not obligated to do so unless you obey what he has already shown you. You see, God has already revealed his entire will in this book, the Holy Scriptures. He's already revealed it. Now all we have to do is we have to obey and do what he has commanded us to do. And that's how you will be in God's will. Christians fail to understand this. They think, you know, we have been taught from childhood, God speaks in various ways and shows you his will through elders, through godly Christians and all that. Well, all that is fine. You need to do God's will that has already been written and revealed in this book. Unless you do that, you will not be in God's will. But once you do the things that God has already revealed in the scriptures, then you are in God's will and he directs you every step. Because again, the problem is Christians say, all right, I know that there are you know, those six or seven places in the Bible where it's very clear what God's will is. Uh, you know, our sanctification is God's will and he doesn't will that any should perish and a lot of things like that. Once I do all these things, how about my practical life? How about my day-to-day -day life? How will I know God's will? You see, brethren, once you do the things that God has already revealed in the scriptures, you don't have to find out God's will. You will be in God's will. Remember that. You will do God's will as you live according to what is already written in the scriptures. You don't have to specially find out anything. Yes, yes, God does show. I'm not saying you can't pray about anything and ask God whether it's his will or not. You can go ahead and do that. All that is there. But the first thing is you have to do what is written in the scriptures. But you know what the problem is? The flesh. Our flesh does not allow us to do that. It's not just about trying to decide whether you will do God's will or not, whether you are interested in it or not. To do God's will means to come under the yoke of God. You see, you're not doing what is your will. You are coming under somebody's uh, uh, yoke. Somebody else, and that is God. You're trying to do what he wants, not what you want. That means you're going to allow God to put a yoke upon you. So that he can direct you. It's as simple as that for you to understand. If you allow God to put a yoke on you, then God has control over your life and he can guide you and direct your paths. But if you don't allow him to put that yoke upon you, he cannot direct you. He cannot keep you in his will. That is the issue here. So you see, we are as that bullock that is unaccustomed to the yoke. When God tries to put that yoke upon us, we struggle, we fight back, we do not submit to God's will, to God's yoke. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, Matthew 11 verses 29 and 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus Christ would like to put his yoke upon you, not just for salvation, to trust in him, but after that. He wants us to get accustomed to his yoke and he says, my yoke is not burdensome, it is not heavy, but it is light, it is easy. You will find rest to your souls. Yes, it is that moment uh, when he tries to put that yoke upon you, which is the most difficult time in your life. But once he puts it on you and you allow him to do so, you will see it is light, it is not burdensome, and it gives rest to your soul. Nothing can give more rest to the Christian in this life than being in the center of God's will. But you see what our problem is. We are unaccustomed to the yoke and we do not allow the Lord to put it on us. When he tries, we struggle, we rebel, we complain, we murmur. And we say, you don't love me, God. Look at what you're doing to me. Right? There are a lot of Christians who do that. They struggle and they rebel and they fight back. 
they run away. So you see, the only way God can get us accustomed to the yoke is by chastisement. Christians most of the times don't understand because of the problems they go through as to why God is allowing that to happen in their lives. It is God's chastisement upon you and you don't have to feel ashamed about it. What does the Bible say? If you are not uh, chastised by God, then you are not a son, you are a bastard. But because he loves you, he chastises you. The more chastisement a Christian receives, the more it is a proof of God's love for you. So that's why the Bible says, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't do that. Don't despise God. Don't despise God's chastening. But embrace it because what God is trying to do is get you accustomed to the yoke. Because you are as that bullock that is unaccustomed to the yoke. What does that uh, owner of the bullock do when he's unaccustomed to the yoke? And when he fights back and does not allow him to put the yoke, he forces him to put it on. He chastises him if necessary. Ties him up and gets him accustomed to it. And that's what God would like to do through chastisement. Christians, please remember this. If God is chastising you, it's not because he hates you. It's so that he, he can accustom you to the yoke so that you can be in God's will and do God's will in your life. So that he can lead us, guide us, and keep us in his will, in the center of his will. And that's God's desire for you and for me. What exactly is chastisement? What does the Bible talk about it? What does the Bible say about chastisement? Firstly, in the scriptures, chastisement is correction. Chastisement is correction. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son... Despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. We need constant correction. Christians, remember, we are in this world which is hostile to us as born-again Christians. The God of this world is the devil. And he uses everything in his power to work against us and to destroy us. And to lead us astray from God's will. To lead us astray from the path that God has chosen for us. Our own flesh is our enemy. Fighting against spiritual things inside of us. So we are surrounded by enemies. The world, the devil and the flesh. And uh, there are, uh, it is so easy and we are so prone to go out of the way. And whenever we go out of the way, it is God's duty to correct us, to put us back in the right path. Correction is what chastisement is. When God chastises us, he is correcting us because we are doing something wrong, he is correcting us. Secondly, chastisement is instruction in the Bible. It's not just about getting beaten up by God, but it's also God teaching us a lesson, teaching us something. Look at Psalm 94 verse 12. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. Isn't that interesting? God doesn't come with a stick and just beat us up for pleasure, to satisfy himself or anything like that. He chastises us to correct us and to instruct us, to teach us a lesson. And that's wonderful. Praise God that God uses chastisement for these purposes. Not only that, but in the Bible, chastisement is protection from God. What do I mean by that? Look at Psalm 94, verse 13. Psalm 94, verse 13. That thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. Those who are not God's people, you know, their end is what? A pit is digged for the wicked there. But you see, when you are uh, chastised by God, he gives you rest 
and protects you from the days of adversity. He keeps you from evil by chastising you. That's what chastisement is. It is for our protection so that we don't go and hurt ourselves more. If God allows us to live by ourselves, we will go and destroy ourselves. God is protecting us, keeping us safe by chastising us. But that's not all. There is another reason why God chastises his children. Chastisement is for perfection in the Christian. <coughs> Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 10 and 11. Hebrews 12, 10 and 11. For they verily for a few days chastised us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Note it down, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Again, underline that. The peaceable fruit of uh, righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. God does all these things in order that he may get us accustomed to the yoke. And that we should, and that is something we should never forget. Never forget. That God's chastening is based on his infinite love for you and me as born again Christians. Always, always keep this in mind when uh, you are chastised by God. Remember that it is based on his infinite love for us. He chastises us because he loves us and wants the very best for us as Christians, for our lives here on earth. If Christians realize this, uh, that in this life, God doesn't... Uh, give Christians health, wealth, and prosperity as he promised it to Israel in the Old Testament. But in this life, as in this dispensation of the church that we are living in, God's purpose for us is holiness. God's purpose for us is to be righteous and bring forth that peaceable fruit of righteousness and uh, that we might be partakers of his holiness here in this life. If we realize that, we will be living reality. What I mean is, all these other Christians who think, no, no, God wants us to have this health, wealth and prosperity here now, in this life, our best life now, and all that nonsense, are living in a dream world. They are living in a deception. Not reality. That's not truth. But once you get the right view of these things, then you will have a right understanding of all these things. God is holy. He wants you to be holy. And in order to keep you holy, he will chastise you. And that's why all the problems come into our life. All these problems that we face and suffer most of the times, if not all the time, are God's chastisement to perfect us, to, to produce that fruit of righteousness in us, that we may be partakers of his holiness. And once you understand that, a lot of things would become clear to you in your own personal life. And God wants you to have this great understanding about his will and chastisement and the connection between them. All right, so once again, I want you to look at those words that we have read in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 18 to 20. Keep your Bibles open to Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 20, uh, 18 to 20 and we'll be looking at those verses i've said a few things by way of introduction about god's will and chastisement now let us look what really happened here with the prime the first thing you see in verse 18 it says i have surely heard ephraim bemoaning himself thus what is happening here here you have Ephraim and Ephraim is bemoaning himself in a certain way. What happened is that Ephraim has come to a realization in his life. He has come to a realization that he is outside of God's will and that he is like a bullock 
unaccustomed to the yoke. And this realization is very important in your life, Christian. And this realization consists of firstly realizing this, this simple truth that we are as bullocks unaccustomed to the yoke, to the yoke of God, to the yoke of Jesus Christ upon us. And this produces this bemoaning. The real turning point in the Christian's life is when he begins to realize that he is being chastised by God. Christians don't realize that they go through troubles, they are neck deep, uh, deep in problems, and they lose sight of God in their lives. They think God has left them, they think God is, uh, does not care for them, they think that God is no longer a part of their lives. They think they have to face everything by their own. It's very sad, but that's how Christians are, and that's why they become bitter with God. They think God doesn't love them anymore, but the opposite is true. God allows this, these troubles and these trials in your life so that he can accustom you to the yoke because he loves you. But once you realize that this is God's hand in your life, well, that's a turning point, Christian. Everything will change from there. And if I realize that, he be born himself. Because he understood that all the while this chastisement was from God. <coughs> Once a Christian realizes that the chastisement is from God, you know what will happen? He will immediately look into himself to see what is it that I have done that has warranted this chastisement from God. God doesn't chastise you for his pleasure as we have read in Hebrews 12. God doesn't do it because he loves to look at you suffer. Remember always, God has a purpose. We have seen the purposes of chastisement, what chastisement is and what it does to a Christian. So once you realize that God is chastising you, you will see that God doesn't do it because he's bored and has nothing else to do. There is something wrong that you have done. It could be that you have made a wrong decision. It could be a sin in your life. It could be anything that is not according to God's will. And immediately he brings the stick to correct you, to put you in the right path. He does that. And once you realize that, it changes everything. And then you accuse yourself before God and say, yes, Lord, I'm wrong. I'm suffering this not because I don't deserve it. It's because... I have done something wrong. You ask God to show you if you don't know what it is. And God will show it to you. If it's a sin or if it's a wrong decision or whatever, even if it's a small thing that has displeased God, he will show it to you so that you can get it right with God. And that most of the times would stop the chastisement from God. Now mark this please, that uh, when you accuse yourself and you justify God, that pleases him. You know, that's the way it should be with the Christian life. When you suffer, you accuse yourself and you justify God. And you say, Lord, I deserve it. But, and you are righteous in uh, meeting out this chastisement. That's the attitude of a Christian. From self-accusation, then the soul is led on by the Spirit of God to self-condemnation. These are things that Christians don't do anymore. Again, they have a very high view about themselves. They, I will talk on the other side as well. Don't get me wrong, but they think they are very good. They think there's nothing wrong with them. They think they are very spiritual. That is self-righteousness. Be careful. Nothing can destroy you like self-righteousness. It's very subtle. You think I don't commit adultery. I don't uh, drink. I don't smoke. Uh, I don't keep bad company. I don't do all the wicked things that other people do. So I'm a good person. Never think that. Never. Ever think that. That makes you self-righteous, a fool. But you should engage in self-accusation and self-condemnation before God in prayer. Now I'm not saying that you sit and cry and uh, do all those things. No, not like that. But you confess to God and say, Lord... I'm a sinful man. 
I have no goodness of my own. I have no righteousness of my own. Left to myself, I will do nothing but evil. There is nothing good in me. Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. You need to do that. The Bible talks about it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, what happens? Read on. We are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Christian, did you ever think about this? What is it? You, there is a place for self-accusation and self-condemnation or self-judgment, if you would like to put it that way, in the Christian's life. When you judge yourself, you are judged and you are chastised. That is a chastisement. That's a form of chastisement before God. You chastise yourself and you're not condemned. And Christians completely fail to do this most of the times. They are very, very careless about this great exercise of spending time with God to, to judge yourself, to judge yourself, your thoughts, your motives, your heart, your ways before the Lord. Judge yourself before God. And that is a form of chastisement. It's a very mild form of chastisement, but it is chastisement. And that's a wonderful thing for you to do. Is uh, Ephraim bemoaned himself. And that's what Christians need to do when we come before God. We bemoan ourselves. We look at how sinful and wicked we are by nature. Now the other side is, God comforts you by showing you how he has justified you by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And once you see that, that gives you great comfort. So unless you see how wicked you are, the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't become precious to you as a Christian. That's why it's important to judge yourself. That's why it's important to sometimes condemn yourself before God. That is a form of chastisement. The realization is important that this is from God, that I'm worthy of it, and God is justified in doing it. That is the turning point. Uh, that would be the turning point in your life. Look at that in the first place. Ephraim bemoans himself. To mourn sinful acts is one thing, all right? Uh, if you are mourning because you have done something wrong, yeah, you need to do that. That's one thing. But you see, that's not really godly sorrow. Most of the times when Christians bemoan their sinful acts, they do it because they are afraid of the consequences of their sinful acts. They are afraid what's going to happen. How they're going to receive chastisement for the things that they have done. But Ephraim bemoaned himself. Godly sorrow is when you bemoan your own sinful nature, yourself, more than the things that you have done. It is the wickedness of the heart that produces all these sins. It is not the sins, like somebody said, it is not your sins that make you a sinner, but because you're a sinner, you commit those sins. It's the sinful nature that we need to, uh, to uh, bemoan. Like Paul cried out and said, Oh, wretched man that I am, he said. And he said uh, that he is the chief of all sinners. That is bemoaning himself. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, we read verses 9 and 10. <coughs> now I rejoice that ye were made sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. 
for he were made sorry after a godly manner that he might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Ephraim bemoaned himself, not the works that he has committed, but how wicked he is, how sinful he is. And that's what we need to do before God as Christians. Yes, we are saved. We are justified. We have been given the righteousness of Christ, but we are living in the flesh. And in the flesh dwelleth no good thing. And that's why we need to constantly uh, do this bemoaning of ourselves before God in prayer. And say to him, Lord, I am a sinful man. And that produces that godly sorrow in the Christian that works repentance. You see, uh, the, the reason why most of the times your repentance is short-lived is because you have repented, yes, of the things that you have done, the wrong things that you have done. You have had sorrow for the bad things that you have done. But did you ever have sorrow for the wickedness of your heart? Did you ever bemoan yourself before God and say, Oh, wretched man that I am. How sinful, how wicked. There is nothing good in me, O oh God. That makes you depend more on Him. And that makes you look at the righteousness of Christ with a more clear understanding. How beautiful it is that we wretched, wild sinners, despicable, have been given the righteousness of Christ so that we actually can approach God and speak to him in this manner and be the recipients of his love even if he shows his love many times through chastisement he does show his love for you and for me the one thing that you must understand is if you uh, just sorrow after the uh, or uh, if you just sorrow for the, have sorrow for the things that you have done it could most probably be worldly sorrow and it could only be sorrow because of the fear that you have that you will reap the consequences of your sins when you do that it could be uh, you know a uh, the work of the natural conscience that's all it could be it could be the work of the natural conscience which is yet unenlightened by the spirit of God that's why you're mourning those things that you have done because you fear the backlash. But when you have godly sorrow, it is the genuine mark of a soul that has been under the conviction, that has been under conviction through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures. Once that conviction comes, you see that you have done those bad things because you're so wicked and you're so wild. Once you realize that, then the turning point begins in your life. God chastises you so that you come to that point and realize that you have done all these wicked things because you have a wicked heart, because you are a wicked person by nature. Yes, you are born again, but naturally, that's how you are. This realization consists, firstly, of bemoaning ourselves but secondly this realization consists of accepting this chastisement as from God without doing that it would all fail if you just sit down and bemoan yourself and say oh how wicked I am how sinful I am and stop there you will go into another uh, uh, dangerous situation of self-pity Oh, you know how I'm so wicked and so bad. What can I do? And, you know, you would just be too sad about yourself. You must take each step correctly in order for you to be in the center of God's will and be accustomed to that yoke that God wants to put upon you. It says, Ephraim not only, uh, okay, it says like this, Ephraim bemoaned himself thus. How did he bemoan himself? Look at that. Thou has chastised me, he says. Thou has chastised me. The realization is that this is chastisement. All right, because I'm sinful, I deserve it. So that God can put me in the right path. But the second thing is, 
to realize that this particular trouble, this particular trial, this particular suffering is because God is chastising me. That is important for you to accept. Um, thou hast chastised me. It is a very beneficial thing that he is talking about. He's not talking about a sad thing. Oh, God has beaten me up black and blue and left me there to die. It's not like that. You know it. God is there in the midst of the greatest trouble or trial that you are going through. And he allows only so much that you can bear. And only so much as is necessary to get you accustomed to the yoke. So accept it as from God. That gives you great comfort. You see, brethren, if you are in the hands of the devil, and the devil has a free hand with you, he will destroy you completely, correct? He asked Jesus Christ to allow him to sift Peter. Praise God. God doesn't allow anything more than what is required. You are not in the hands of the devil. You are in the hands of God. Because you are a born again Christian. God doesn't leave you into the hands of the devil. Remember when Paul uh, wanted to punish that person who sinned in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians. He said, give him up to the devil. Give him up to the devil so that uh, you know his flesh uh, is taken care of. The flesh problem would be taken care of. But he said, pray for such a person, lest he should be overwhelmed with, with sorrow and be lost completely. Not salvation wise, but you know, he would fall away. Pray, speak to him and bring him back, he says. That's how it is. Even if God uses the devil to chastise you, he will not allow him to do more than what his purpose is for your life. Storms may come in your life, terrible storms. Terrible problems, all sorts of things, misery sometimes. But God allows it all so that he can accustom you to the yoke. You need to realize it and you need to accept it as from God. That gives you comfort because you know that this chastisement is from God. I'm in the hands of God. Like David, remember what he said? God gave him a few choices. He said, how shall I punish you, David? He said, I don't want to fall into the hands of man. Let me fall into the hand of God, he says. I'd rather die in God's hands than live at the mercy of other people or the devil or whoever it may be. David was a man who knew God and he knew it was better to receive correction from God than to be away from him and in the hands of the devil or in the hands of the world. They'll destroy you. But once you realize that this is from God, it comforts you knowing that God is still in control of your life. But this realization also consists of understanding the reason for the chastisement. Realization begins with bemoaning yourself. You accept and say, yes, I have done something wrong and that's why God allowed it. Secondly, you accept it as from God himself and not from anybody else. But thirdly, you try and understand the reason for it. It says about uh, Ephraim, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. He understood why God allowed that chastisement in his life. I was chastised. Because I have been like a bullock that is unaccustomed to the yoke. I have been fighting of God's will. I have been uh, trying to keep him out of the most important things in my life. I was trying to do my will. And that's why God has chastised me. I already explained it to you what it means to get accustomed to the yoke. It means to allow God to direct your lives. It is to allow God to keep you in His will. I've also said what God accomplishes through chastisement and the result that He expects from us. It is total, absolute surrender and submission to His perfect will. But let me go into a little bit more detail about this before I close. When God chastises us, 
so that he can get us accustomed to the yoke. Remember, the, the whole point here is getting accustomed to the yoke. Whatever God does, he does so that he gets you to be accustomed to the yoke. And God uses chastisement to do that, as we have seen in the text. When God does that, you know what he does? Basically, he brings us into a situation where we become absolutely helpless in our lives. Absolutely helpless. Have you been in such a condition before? You come, to, you hit rock bottom. There is nowhere else for you to look but up. That's the condition that God brings you into sometimes. You, you feel absolutely helpless. It is a place where money cannot help you. You cannot buy yourself out of that trouble. Money cannot help you. Men cannot help you. Your mind or your wisdom cannot help you. Your own strength cannot help you uh, to, to, to get out of that situation. It could be a sickness and you look to doctors and hospitals and they are not able to help you. They are not able to uh, get you back to good health. It could be a financial problem. You look to your friends and family for help and nobody is able to help you out with that. It could be a danger to your life. It could be a danger to the life of your loved ones and you are helpless absolutely to protect yourself or to protect your loved ones. And you have nowhere to turn to for help. Maybe it is a need that you have and there is no way for that need to be fulfilled in your life. It could be a hundred other things. It could be suffering in different forms. All that is chastisement. God uses to accustom you to the yoke. He brings you into a helpless situation. That's important for you to know. There is nobody who is able or willing probably even to help you. Now in such a situation, as a Christian, what would you do? You would immediately cry out to God. <coughs> that would be your natural response, or at least that should be your natural response. You get down on your knees and you look to God because you hit rock bottom. You're looking up now and saying, Lord, there is nobody to help me but thee. But you know what happens in that situation? You would, seem, uh, you would think that the heavens are made of brass and your prayers are not penetrating this brass wall that is stopping you from looking to God, from sending your prayers to God. You would feel like your prayers are just falling down to the ground and God is not listening. Even praying will not help you in such a moment. Have you ever experienced that in your life? You tried everything. Even praying and no answer to your prayer. Absolute helpless condition. Nobody is helping you. Not even God is answering your prayer. You expect God to answer your prayer. You expect God to help you out of that impossible place that you are stuck in. But even the heavens are silent. Did you ever experience that in your life? No matter how much you pray, no answer from God. You take the promises of God and you go to him in prayer and you plead the promises before him. No answer. Did you ever experience that? It's a horrible, horrible condition to be in. But God loves it in the Christian's life. In spite of all your praying, in spite of all your pleading, there seems to be no answer or relief from God. The heavens seem to be made of brass. Really. That's how you feel at that time. You are unable to do anything. You are absolutely helpless in such a condition. There is that feeling of misery. That uh, gross darkness enveloping your mind, your heart. You feel miserable and you would desire to die than to live in such a time. That's the point to which God can allow a Christian to be brought to. 
Don't think God has forsaken you in such a time. Never think like that because that's when the devil comes in with his suggestions. He says, look, look at your condition. Where is your God? What happened to all your faith in, in Jesus Christ? You said that God has promised it and he will keep his promises. God has broken his promise. He doesn't love you. He doesn't care for you. He will make you feel even more miserable at that time. And you would be like Job who wanted to just die. That's the condition that God can allow you to fall into. So that he can get you accustomed to the yoke. Uh, uh, this situation is something that I want you to think about. Uh, an absolutely helpless situation. When Christians fall into that situation, you know what they do sometimes? That's when they begin to despise the chastening of God. And they say, what kind of a God are you? How can you be so merciless? How can you be so void of love and feelings for me, your child? They become bitter with God. Be careful, Christian. Be very careful. That's why it is important for you to lay a solid foundation for your life with this book. Unless that foundation is there and you're standing upon it, in a situation like that, there is every possibility that you can become very bitter with God and with other people around you. God doesn't want that to happen. You despise the chastening of the Lord. You start murmuring, complaining against the Lord. Some would even accuse God of unfaithfulness when this happens in their lives. You know why did we do that? It's because... We are as that bullock, unaccustomed to the yoke. We are struggling. We are not allowing God to put it upon us. We fight back. We complain. We rebel. And we run away from God. But remember, it will help you if you remember that this chastisement is from my father. And he is chastising me because he loves me. And so that he can put his yoke upon me, that I could get accustomed to the yoke. Remember what Jesus said to Paul at the time of his conversion in Acts chapter 9 verse 5. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. If you keep fighting against God when he brings you into such a situation, you will hurt yourself. You will hurt yourself. Don't do that. Allow God to put that yoke upon you. It is difficult. It will be painful. Very painful. But once you allow him to put it and once you get accustomed to the yoke, you will see that his yoke is easy and light. And he, it gives rest to your souls as we have read in uh, Matthew chapter 11. That's what he wants for your life as a born again Christian. God brings us into such a situation so that he may break us. Unless he breaks you, you will not allow him to put that yoke upon you. But that breaking point is the most painful thing you will ever experience in this life. Christian, you will not even know how hell would be. You have absolutely no clue and you will never know how it would be for a person to burn in hell. We only know what we read about hell in the Bible. But we'll never experience it. But there is a hell that we experience here on this earth. That's all the hell we will experience. It is here on this earth. And when God breaks us, that's how you would feel. That all hell has broken loose in your life. The forces of hell have ganged up against you to destroy you. And there would be a lot of suffering in such a situation. Never forget that. But also remember, God is still in control. He is allowing all this so that he can break you. And once you are broken in his sight, of a broken and of a contrite spirit, then he can easily put that yoke upon you and you get accustomed to it. And he uses you for his glory then and only then. Without breaking, there can be no using by God. Just like a bullock, a bullock has to be broken. Just like a horse, you cannot 
get a horse from the wild and sit on it and start riding. It will kick you and it will kill you probably. You need to break that horse. You need to bring it into control. You need to bring it under your control. You need to bring that bullock under your control. He's not naturally accustomed to taking orders from you. That's how we are. We are not naturally accustomed to listening to God or doing the will of God. God has to break us and then put his yoke upon us. And then, uh, only then can he use us for his glory. That situation, you know, in that most terrible situation that God brings you, where you are absolutely helpless and even God doesn't answer your prayer, you know what God will teach you at that time? When he breaks you, he makes you realize that you can get nothing by yourself. He first shows you how weak you are, how sinful you are. But secondly, he also shows you this, that you cannot even have any power with God by yourself. You cannot get anything from God in your natural strength. If he chooses not to give you, you cannot get it from him. He brings you to that point. He breaks you and makes you understand your utter worthlessness, your utter sinfulness and wickedness. And of course our unworthiness. And then, and only then, do things start to become better in your life. After the breaking, that's when you're in a position to be used by God. You say, Lord, I want to be in the center of God's will. He will break you first. And then and only then can you be in the center of God's will. Unless God breaks you, you cannot absolutely surrender and submit yourself to his will. Christian, don't forget that. Don't say lightly, oh, I want to do God's will. I want to be uh, in the center of God's will. Don't be foolish. Do you know what it means? It means a lot of suffering for the Christian in this life. Of course, that's what gets us rewards. After the chastisement come the rewards, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And that's what God uh, teaches us. And that's what we learn from this passage about Ephraim. Ephraim was like a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. But you see that God helped him to realize it, helped him to accept it. And he says, I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. This is how he puts his yoke upon us in such a situation that we break down and we submit ourselves to his will. And we say to him, Lord, if this is what you will do, if this is what you want to do, Lord, then so be it unto me according to thy will. You will even accept that chastisement as God's will. You say, Lord, okay, this is your will that I should suffer like this. So be it. I submit. That's the point God wants to bring you to. That's exactly where he wants you to be. He doesn't want you to murmur and complain like the Israelites did in the wilderness. He wants you to come to a point where you are so helpless that you and so weak that you cannot even complain or murmur anymore. You say, Lord, you want to kill me? If it is your will, then I submit to it. That's the point he wants you to come to, breaking point. And then comes the building up. And that's the most beautiful thing about God. He doesn't allow us to just wallow there in that misery. He brings us up like that great prophet said, Rejoice not over me, O my, o my enemy. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. When I fall, he will lift me up. God allows it to come into our lives so that he may ultimately build us up and bring us to that place where he wants us to be. You talk so much about God's will. Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to submit absolutely to God? Total surrender. Will you allow God to break you? Will you say, Lord, whatever happens, I am willing to be in the center of your will. It will be very painful. Very painful. But it will yield great rewards, great fruit in your life, in this life and in the life 
to come. Now there are some, uh, a few more things that I would like to speak about this, but I will stop here for today and the Lord willing, we will consider the subject again the coming Sunday. We have looked at the realization that Ephraim had of this chastisement. We have seen uh, the various facets of this realization that Ephraim had about God's chastisement. And we will look at the ramification, the result of the coming week, the Lord willing. What happened to Ephraim after that? But the point today is for you to note this, that God allows sufferings in your life, Christian, so that he can correct you, so that he can put you in the right path, so that he can get you accustomed to the yoke. Do not struggle, do not fight back, do not rebel, do not try to run away from God, do not murmur and complain, but submit. Submit to him and say, Lord, if this is what you will in my life, here I am, Lord, let it be to me according to thy will. Don't be like those foolish baby Christians who, who think they can just name it and claim it, that no suffering is meant for this life. They think, oh, it's all right, you know, all you have to do is have faith, keep the faith, go to God and claim it by faith and your suffering will go, your sickness will go. No, if God is going to heal all your diseases, you'll never die. Did you ever think about it? That's why you see all these old people in these healing meetings on wheelchair. They don't want to die physically. They're afraid of death. They don't have that peace. They don't have that assurance that when they die, they will go to heaven. They want to keep on enjoying good health. They don't see that God may be trying to get their attention. God may be trying to teach them something through that suffering. They fail it. And when they don't get that healing they want, they lose their faith in God. Or they go away from God. They become bitter against God. And all these things happen. Christian suffering is designed to bring out the, uh, you know, this result in us that we could be accustomed to the yoke. So if you have ever thought, why me Lord? Why am I suffering all these things? The answer is very simple because God's purpose for your life is so great that unless he brings you through the valley of chastisement, you cannot walk on the uh, mountain tops of God's will and God's purpose for your life. You have to go through the dark valley before you come up to that height in your life where you can uh, do what God desires you to do. That you would be accustomed to the yoke and you would just be directed by God and you would be in the center of, your, uh, of His will. Christian, I pray that this would be a comfort to you in the midst of your sufferings. Submit yourself to God, to the shepherd of your soul in the midst of all your suffering. And if you are an unsaved person, let me say this to you, that God uh, has, has given his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins. You are a sinner. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible also says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You are a sinner and you're worthy of death and hell, but God wants you to be saved. God wants you to be his child. And in order to do that, he sent his son to bear the penalty for your sins. He paid for your sins with his own blood upon the cross. It's his blood atonement. Upon the cross that can save you that will save your soul he suffered he bled and he died on the cross for your sins he was buried and he rose up again on the third day according to the scriptures and you must trust this blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ for yourself you must say I'm a sinner I'm worthy of hell but I believe that God paid the penalty for my sins he took upon himself my punishment on that cross and you trust Jesus Christ to have done this for you the Bible says that you will be saved the Bible says as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God you must believe and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior once you do that and you receive and accept the payment that he has made in your place 
once you accept that he has done all this for you upon the cross, you become a child of God. God imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to you. Jesus Christ comes inside of you and he is the righteousness of God. And you are once again restored into fellowship with God as mankind should have been from the beginning. He will save your soul and he will be in charge of your life. He will lead you and guide you, protect you, supply your needs and help, him, uh, help you to know him more and more in this life and then take you to heaven to be with him forever. Will you trust him as your savior right now? No good works can save you. Remember that. Baptism cannot save you. Uh, the Lord's table cannot save you. If you are a Roman Catholic, you are being lied to. Uh, no priest can save you. There is no uh, mediator between God and men but the Lord Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus. Mary or Joseph or none of the saints or angels can ever help you. It is Jesus Christ who can save your soul. They didn't die for you on the cross. Jesus did. It is a person that can save you, not your good works, not your morals, not your religion, not your education. Not your philosophies. Nothing can save you but the person of Jesus Christ and faith in his death and resurrection for your sins as, an, uh, uh, as a substitute for you upon that cross. Once you trust him, you will be saved and God will begin to direct your life according to his will. May the Lord bless us with the preaching of this word. Let us pray. Let us close in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for teaching us about the yoke that you want us to put on so that we may do your will. I pray, Lord, that you will give us the strength we need to bear the chastisement that you uh, give to us, Lord, for our good. Help us to always keep in mind that your motive is love, that uh, you are doing it for us, for our benefit, so that we may be partakers of your holiness and that you may produce a peaceable fruit of righteousness in us. Give us the grace and strength, Lord, for we are weak. Lord, we are very, very weak and very sinful. And uh, this chastisement goes against our flesh so much that we cannot accept it. So we pray that you will give us the strength that we need to receive it as from you. And also, Lord, we pray that our faith would not falter when we go through such times. But let our faith in the scriptures, in the Lord Jesus Christ, be so strong that we would come out of those helpless situations, uh, Lord, rejoicing for the work that you have done in us. Bless your people who have heard this message and who will hear in the days to come with, this, uh, with the words of the scripture. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you very much. The Lord bless you.